Hello fellow artists and welcome to episode 6 of TED Talks Art. Today's topic is the fear of failure and how to overcome it. I think this is a big one. I think it's something that is ongoing and every artist goes through it and will continue to go through it. And that fear of failure, um, of course, can come in many forms. It could be that feeling of um, failing in our art, in our skills, um, perhaps in comparison to others. Failure in terms of job career or career path, um, even in terms of the opportunities we get and don't get. In some cases, it might be even... um, that fear of failing to even just follow the career according to what you had hoped. Maybe it didn't go, maybe you're doing okay, but it's not going according to the timeline or uh, exactly the way that you envisioned or planned. And that's that's only natural and that's human nature. We all want what's best and we will do what we can to, do, to achieve that. But I think um, the first thing that we need to tackle and it's it sometimes seems so obvious and right under our nose that we don't even think about it or um, we just it just kind of passes us by. And it's a simple fact of life, really. And that fact of life is failure will happen. Failure is unavoidable. Now, I don't mean that in terms of a pessimistic attitude or a giving up or defeatist. It's actually quite the opposite. It means uh, embracing the, the fact that failure will come in some form or fashion. So rather than fearing it or running away from it, it's, well, what do we do about it once it happens? And that is a turning point because that, first of all, can... Um, be rid of unnecessary uh, stress, I suppose. Um, I mean, any kind of failure, failure, of course, is hard to deal with. But if you're putting all your energy even before that in terms of the fear of of the um, the unknown or what could come or what may come, then that's sort of wasted mental and emotional energy. Rather, if we kind of approach it as, well, it's going to happen. Of course, I'm going to do all I can to minimize that because you don't want to have unnecessary failure or or, or 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 suffering, I suppose, because it is, a ty- it is a type of suffering. But when we realize that it is inevitable, then we have a different change. It's kind of like saying, oh, I hope there's no battle to come. Or what if we are aware of some kind of battle or war that's ahead of us? Then it's a not it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Therefore we won't be worrying about if it's gonna happen. Instead we will turn our attention to prepare ourselves and to fight back. And and that's really where our you know, our strength and our willpower can come through because we're not paralyzed by that fear. Um, I think I want to tackle perhaps some certain examples of fear of failure. Um, let's say in one case, a common one that I think we all go through and will continue to go through at different points, is perhaps that fear of um, not living up to our what we'd hope our skill potential would be. Especially if you're trying your best and you're working hard and then, you know, the wonderful thing about this day and age with the internet is we see so much you know great art and many great artists and it's very inspiring encouraging but sometimes it could also be discouraging because you can see, you sort of see where you stand and you you can't help but have a little more honest appraisal and a bigger picture of where you stand in your art but i think it's common to feel that way and i think the ones that are able to get through it, uh, that type of feeling isn't lasting. It's short-lived, very short-lived, because I think, I know for myself, I may look at something, oh, wow, that's amazing, and oh, I'm so far behind that. But that quickly dissipates into now, wow, this person in the art really inspires me to now want to get back to my desk and start working and start drawing. And that's a, that's a healthy kind of um I guess, I don't know if you want to call it competition or 
Um, but you're turning that into something that's more positive. Now, what do you do about when that kind of feeling isn't short-lived? What if we sink into that kind of spiral, that downward spiral, that you might start feeling that way, but instead of getting inspired, turning around and getting inspired, it gets worse. You start to get more discouraged, um, and that kind of prohibits you from, from even attempting to draw. Worst cases, it might make you embittered, um, may make you resentful, and when that happens, uh, you start to really miss out on the good things in life, not only in art, but life in general. I think what happens is, um, as life carries on, and gets as we grow older, and as life gets a little more cir- uh, challenging with its various circumstances, it's hard not to be distracted and actually forget how we got what brought us here in the first place. Kind of like um, in terms of how the world is seen through a child's eyes and that innocence and that joy and how that could change. It will inevitably change uh, as they get older, but there's something that hopefully is inherent where they keep that joy with them even until their old age. A common thing with artists, especially those in entertainment, is what brought us here to begin with. It was our love of things like cartoons and comic books and toys and animation and video games. And there's that part that never really went away. You know, I, you know, I, I always kind of consider myself that um, the big kid that's still inside, deep down, in, you know, in my heart. Um, and that's a big reason why I still am excited about drawing, and I never get tired of it. Never gets old. And um, it's something that it's forever going to be a part of my life. And I know many of you feel the same way. Now, the difference between that and when you're a child is, well, you know, you got other things, responsibilities. You know, I have a wife and kids and work and got to pay the bills and things like that of that nature. But rather than be distracted too much by that you use those things to build you and make you stronger and um, learn from that and no matter how difficult uh, life can get or how divided your time is or my time is the thing is I always carve out some time to do my art of course it's harder to find that time it's not as available that time is precious but it's possible and you can make it happen at the end of the day because what you care about, what you have priority for, or more specifically, what you have passion for, you'll make time. And I think that's the key right there. The way to combat this kind of fear is to remember where your passion is, where it was at the beginning and what still drives you. The key is no matter how big the challenge or, or you know, circumstance or the, the failure that has happened is ensure that that passion you have is greater than that fear and then you can overcome it. And what I've noticed is, uh, you know, the fear can grow into other things, right? Enough of that will turn into an insecurity. Enough of that insecurity will turn into this feeling of being being threatened, and when you're threatened, that's tied, it's mixed with both insecurity and fear, and that can cause us to act in certain ways. When I look through um, the past, you know, almost 20 years, I guess, from the moment I went to art school uh, until this day, is how that. Uh, tie-in between fear and security or insecurity is really connected. For example, every one of us has experienced um, people who were, people who are, you know, our leaders, could be a teacher, could be um, a lead artist or art director or something, someone in a position of a certain amount of power, I suppose. And generally, they fall under two camps. The ones that you really respected, the ones you really looked up to, how did they show their authority? Well, more specifically, they they led by example. 
they probably knew what they were talking about. Why? Because they're passionate about what they do. And seeing you um, often reminds them of themselves. And they recall where, when they were starting out. And all they want to do is to help you. Help you to learn. Help you to do your job. Not how to tell you to do it, but how to kind of nurture and for you to grow. And because of that, it's a very honest thing because it's shown through their merit. It's not through some other ulterior motive. And they don't feel threatened by you, for example. Whereas we've all probably encountered those so-called leaders and managers who are exact opposite. The way they show their position is by throwing their weight around and abusing their power. Where does that stem from? A lot of times it's this um, insecurity. Where does that insecurity come from? Well, there's perhaps a second guessing and doubting their own skill set. And a lot of times it's because there's some truth to it. And when that happens, they start to fear subordinates who show great skill. And instead of treating their job as one to help nurture you and essentially help you to eventually take their job in the future and see that as a wonderful growth as opposed to as a threat, um, that's how that starts to turn into abuse of power. You know, That's why we have these phrases like riding on the coattails of others where you see people rise, along, rise up the ladder not because of necessarily their own merit because, but because of their taking credit for those underneath them. So because of that underlying thing, what is missing is that passion that should have been there to begin with that allowed them to get where they are. It's pretty consistent. Now, it doesn't mean people who are passionate about what they do, myself included, that we never have those feelings, but they should be very temporary, very fleeting, as opposed to guiding your overall trajectory of your career and how you treat people. And I've seen that's very consistent, whether when I look at back when I was a student and had teachers and and with observing co-workers and being under leadership and then becoming a lead myself. You know, everything is very consistent in that matter. So the key, um, again, is, is despite all these distracting situations and feelings, and definitely some are, are very valid. I'm not saying they're not valid. But the key is to counteract that fear with remembering and stoking that passion to be greater than that thing you fear. And then that causes us to look at things from another side, you know, instead of being half glass empty, half glass full. For example, for those of you um, who are starting out or perhaps have are now looking for work or have been looking for work and you haven't found it, you know, a common thing for students that I teach is that as time goes by and they haven't had any opportunity work-wise, yeah, there's this feeling of discouragement. Part of the other problem, I think, is what has changed is we become more and more a society of instant gratification and we, we want results quicker quicker than we, we, we should and maybe don't or are lacking some patience. Um, but the way I look at it is, and I know I'm not alone in this, is, and this is what I tell my students and uh, younger artists, look at it this way. The longer that you are not offered a job, um, the longer that time goes by and you get more rejections and no's, as long as you're not idle, meaning you're pouring your heart, your time and effort into continuing to grow in your art, then you're chances of getting hired will only increase and as time goes by it's not a question of if it's just a matter of when right so there's two ways of looking at that let's say it's been a year and you haven't had any jobs yeah it can be discouraging but is that discouragement or that fear of oh my career is not getting anywhere stopping you from working on your art is it greater than your passion for it and causing you to kind of be stagnant or idle then that was is kind of um, 
self-fulfilling that that kind of uh, idea that I'm not going to make it. But exact same scenario, a year has gone by, a lot of rejections and no's, but those rejections instead you've turned into something positive because of your passion for your art. Oh, with every no I get, and especially if they tell me what I need to improve, oh, they said my anatomy is not as strong as it needs to be. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that. And then as time goes by, and as you're working on your skill set, guess what will happen? You increase your chances of getting hired. Right. So there's all these kind of angles to kind of look at this because I know when we say, oh, just be passionate about what you do, be passionate about your art, it sounds kind of very airy and, and kind of fickle maybe, but that's why I want to use these examples, real life examples, practical and um, you know, kind of beneficial, productive attitudes to channeling that passion to something that um, allows you to grow and to see uh, in a different light the situations that come by, right? I know there's that old saying when God closes the door somewhere, he opens a window, but there, there's truth to that. There's truth to that. And I say that to my students as well. And what I tell them is, um, it, let's say, and this just happened recently uh, to a student I've been mentoring, um, they had an opportunity and they were very close. They were basically second, the person that got the job. They were just second, one behind them. And yeah, it can be discouraging, but I just... You know, simply said, you gotta think of it from another point of view. You know, the fact that you got this far into the interview process is really good. It's to your credit. There's always that possibility that you could get hired by that same company later because you're on their radar. Um, but I also, you know, it also means that there's just something better for you out there. And I don't just say those as a just to kind of sugarcoat things or to flatter. I mean, I, I truly believe flattery is the worst kind of lying, which isn't the same as honest, um, positive feedback. That's not what I mean. But flattery, flattery, where it's essentially, you know, puffing somebody up um, without any cause or any evidence or a merit that goes behind it, right? Kind of like those disillusioned American Idol singers who everyone knows is horrible, but they're insistent that they're the best and is just defiant against everyone. That's a very disillusioned and kind of selfish attitude. But when we look at it in terms of every so-called lost opportunity or rejection, it is now a new opportunity to kind of thrive and give us new direction um, and motivation to go on a proper path. So ultimately, and just to kind of simplify and summarize, whenever you're facing some kind of doubt, whenever you have some inkling of fear, whether it's related to your skill set, related to your job uh, or career um, path and having obstacles, just recall what brought you here to begin with. And that's your love and joy, your passion for doing this art and every time you face a larger obstacle or greater fear then stoke that fire for your passion right let's say you you again you're doing very well or you think you are doing well and you are and you're growing and progressing but perhaps you enter a competition or you go for a job and then you realize all of those you're going against maybe are you know they're twice as good as you you know at least then, yeah, that can be discouraging. But instead of looking at someone's art and saying, oh my goodness, their anatomy is just so much better than mine, or their composition skills, or their values, or their sense of color, turn that around, stoke that fire. Oh, wow, that's really amazing what they did. What can I learn from them? Oh, I see what they did with the lighting there. Oh, that rim lighting really adds an extra kind of atmosphere and mood to it. Oh, I see how natural their pose is. Okay, I'm going to work on my anatomy. I'm going to work on my painting and rendering. Uh, I'm going to work on my design skills, whatever it may be, or my animation. Just that passion is there. You just need to stoke it so it's greater than that fear or that discouragement. And you'll turn that into something positive 
and it counteracts actually your situation. It'll increase your skill set. It'll make you more hireable. It'll increase your chances of more opportunity. And essentially, you're creating opportunity for yourself rather than waiting for it to be delivered to you. Uh, so I think that's all I want to say about that. But that's my personal opinion. And that's how I've approached it in terms of whenever you, whenever I have an inkling or something bigger than an inkling of discouragement or sense or fear of failure, then I stoke that fire and get back to the drawing board. So I hope that helps at least one of you. Until next time, take care.